architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture. It's late July 2020 and we are working our way through a series of conversations on architecture in the time of coronavirus. Today we have a double feature for you. I'm talking to two young architects, Benedict Hartle and Ryan Skavnicki, uh, in two separate conversations that we have sewn together for you. Uh, these are young pr practitioners, one in Germany and the other one here in the United States who have very different and very interesting perspectives on what a new way to think about architecture might be. I hope you enjoy them. I look forward to hearing from you if you have comments. Well, Benedict, thank you for taking the time to have this conversation with me on Architecture Talk. It's good in this days of coronavirus. You are in Munich, I'm in Seattle, but through this uh, digital channel, we are sitting in the same room uh, and having a chat. Uh, and uh, uh, I went through, I was looking at your website and I was looking at your work and I was very intrigued by the amazing and fascinating projects that you have put up in some significant detail in your office, which you call opposite office, which we will talk about in one minute. And uh, we will talk about what, what the nature of practice that you follow is all about. But uh, first, uh, I was very intrigued by a project that you put up offering two projects which I were very intriguing and have got some press. Uh, one is the proposal to convert Berlin, the, the new uh, long construction airport in Berlin and saying, well, it could be used as a COVID-19 hospital. And you have also made a proposal to convert Buckingham Palace into a co-housing situation. Let's start by asking you about the motivations for those two projects. They are actively transformative. They're actively insertive. They actively try and repurpose certain buildings in a proactive manner. Is, it, is, it, is that what you mean by opposite? Is that what it is to do opposite program? So first of all, hello, Vikram. Thank you so much uh, for having me here. It's a pleasure for me uh, to be part of this academic discussion in the States. So I'm very delighted um, to be here. So um, the thing about opposite, um, maybe it comes from my personal experience or my personal being that also when I was a child, I tried to think in different ways. So I never wanted to be the majority. I always wanted to be um, something else. That's maybe one part of the name. And the other part is maybe also that I actually never wanted to become an architect. So I studied architecture. I was fascinated about architecture. But um, the work in the office, like the daily work was never like the thing what I really was interested in. So maybe that's the point of um, the name itself. You say you're in the office is about architectural stories. Yeah, it is about stories. And I mean, at the beginning of your podcast, you hear this, um, the voice of uh, Bjarke Ingels, who tells us what architecture is. Yeah. I think he says like architecture is, turning um, fiction into fact fiction into fact yeah and maybe that's not the thing what i believe because i believe architecture can also stay in the fictional world mm. i think it doesn't have to become reality because architecture for me is like a very holistic way of thinking and 
this means like we are also producing ideas, also ideas about our society, and that's also part of architecture. So, so me, tell me what, why that is part of architecture. I completely agree with you. But why are architectural stories the same as architecture, let's say architecture, simplistically understood architecture as buildings? Yeah, that's right. But I mean, building is something that is very much connected to our society. The, like buildings, they, they, on the one hand, they define how we live and on the other hand, how we live define our buildings. So it's also like a, like a mirror of our society. And I think that's also like an important part of architecture. What, what does narrative architecture or architecture as architectural stories, how does that help? How is that, in your worldview, why is that a critical thing? So first of all, I think it's like, it's a speculation. And speculation is always grounded in the present. So no matter how fantastic it may be, it is really about the present moment. And there it can be, or mostly it is a critique. So it also shows us maybe how to improve things. And also it shows us what is absent in the present. And in a way it is just like a, like it also has, has the meaning of escape. So, um, it is the unwillingness to accept the world as it is and to fight for fanciful words of make-believe. So, and I think that's like narrative architecture. So it, it, will, like, it will produce something else and somebody else will think about it. And maybe this just changes our way of thinking. And mm -hmm. in a way it also rewrites the rules in what the real actually is. Yeah, so, so we produce... Like, we yeah, produce sorry, thought sorry. and that produces architecture, then architecture produces thought and thought can produce uh, buildings, you know, so they're both connected, interconnected as two parts of a, of a dyad, two parts of a system. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it is. I think it's like, um, it's also a way of testing. So before you really change something in the built environment, I think you have to change it in, in ways of speculation. Mm -hmm. So I think speculative architecture is bringing like the present and the past, but also the future together. And that's what, 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 what I'm very interested in. Tell us about the uh, Berlin uh, airport project then. Well, um, the Berlin airport project is like we are, there's being built a new airport um, since 16 years in Berlin. So it's the third airport. But as you, as you might know, in Germany, it's very difficult to get up this uh, big project. So we have like um, problems with um, um, fire protection. And there are so many rules, so that it makes it very difficult um, this, this big projects to happen. And in a way, I think that the, this, this society already changed. So 30 years ago, it was, like, it was common to go on vacation just for a, like for a weekend um, to fly somewhere in Europe. But right now, like um, we have pupils around the whole globe going on the streets and demonstrating against the climate change. And therefore I think that flying has another meaning after 13 years. And- You think flying so is declining? It's becoming more obsolete? It is at least a little bit more, I, I don't know how it is in America, but in Europe it's not like um, this hip as it was once before. Mm. So um, I think there's like a word, we call it a f flying shame. It comes uh, from Sweden. Flying um, shame. Yeah. <laughs> so that means if you fly, like you always think about uh, environment and about the climate change. Mm, yes, okay, from a climate perspective. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And that's why we actually are working on the transformation of this airport uh, a long time. But then, as you know, the coronavirus uh, came and I thought uh, that our idea of uh, we wanted to make um, 
sustainable airport. So it should be the first uh, carbon dioxide free airport in the world. That after this coronavirus, nobody will be interested in our our version of um, of the airport. So we had to be fast and I just thought, and also it was the time when the numbers of infections went up. And I thought like it would be great or like in all countries, they were thinking about uh, temporary structures for the, for, for the infected people. That's why I thought, okay, now I'm just making a project about the super hospital, what I called it. And I mean, you can read this project in many ways. But also you can like, of course, it's like kind of a made up project, but in a way it's also like a very practical one. So as you think of a structure for coronavirus, you're needing something which is um, very isolated. And therefore like existing airport is the best solution in my opinion. But of course you can also read the airport in different ways where the airport is more like a symbol. So in one way, for me, the airport is a symbol for globalization. And globalization is also very much affected by the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So first of all, it's the, the spreading of the virus. So it's uh, maybe the, the roots of the virus in, in Germany and in all most of the other countries. But also it's a, like in the, it's a symbol of globalization in a way of international trading mm -hmm. um, and also the trading which the trading routes which didn't function anymore and which will cause an enormous um, effect in our economy and therefore I just think that maybe we also have to rethink the globalization. So this is symbolic. It's 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 critique and critical of globalization in sort of uh, repurposing the building in in in, in uh, as critique of globalization in that sense. Yeah. It is a, it's a hidden critique. Yeah. So what's the opposite vision to globalization and colonization? What's a post-colonial, post-global, political, speculative future look like to you? I I was intrigued by your Glasgow project. And, and your comment that uh, even thinking about Glasgow being there 2068, uh, it, you know, it's it's whatever, 50 feet underwater is what, how I read that uh, collage, yeah. yeah. So um, about globalization, maybe we just have to look at the book of um, Budowski or maybe the exhibition, which was in New York. The theme Architecture was, without architects, that's what you're talking about? Yeah, but also yeah. like the one no new construction, a new way of life is necessary. Mm -hmm. So he thinks or he rethinks regionalism again. And maybe you can also take the deadly virus as it is. So as I said before, like the trading, which wasn't working anymore, maybe shows us that like, for instance, when you build a building in, in Germany, we have parts of the building from all around the world. Yes. So that's in terms of um, sustainability. It's uh, not good for the climate. And it's also, I mean, it's like a, when, you, when you take it on the whole world, it's a very expensive way of living. And um, maybe in times now we can just rethink this and, and maybe get back to the roots of uh, low-tech low architecture and taking regional materials and just like going back a step. Mm -hmm. Low tech and local. Yes. I also wanted to talk to you about uh, Lux, Lux Machina, the, uh, uh, yeah. the, the lighthouse, the la machine for light. Yeah. It sounds very Le Cabusier. Well, it sounds like Goethe. I don't know. Do you know Goethe, the like famous uh, German writer? I, everybody knows Goethe and everybody yeah. knows Faust. And I was going to ask you what it has to do with Goethe and Faust. But first, you know, in your description, uh, or maybe that, so, so you took it entirely from Faust, the, the poetry that you, the language that you have over there about the light coming in, is that from Faust? It is Faust, yeah, but it's maybe, it's transformed a little bit, but it's, uh, 
The building is uh, placed in the story of Faust, yeah. Oh, I and, see. And the building, I think, is in the one scene where you can see, I don't actually don't really remember, um, maybe it's, it was a long time ago, but it was a scene where Faust uh, looks into the light and he wants to see something, mm -hmm. but he, he doesn't see it and then he turns away and he looks into water. And in the mirror, like he sees, he sees what he wants to see. That is maybe the same with the building. What was the meaning of that uh, moment in Faust? The meaning of, it, of Faust is maybe that um, sometimes what? you have to take other routes. So maybe the first and the most obvious way is not the way to achieve your aims. And that's the same with the building. Yeah, so it's like yeah, very yeah. interconnected uh, interior where like this is like a, and in every room so you have like different rooms every room has connection to the sky and it's like I mean it takes you time until you find your way through the building mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's the same with architecture and also with society so mostly the decisions what you make which are made like very fast, they are mostly not the, the best ones. So, and sometimes you have to, as I said before, and also maybe that's kind of the opposite office thing, is that you just think the other way around. That's what like we try to do if we have a project. We also, we start at the beginning with the task itself. So we, we try to rethink the task and, um, that sometimes gives another aspect to the project. Mm -hmm. Well, I would have imagined uh, in Faust, you know, light is usually the, the traditional metaphor for knowledge, right? Yeah. And looking at water and looking at reflection is the traditional metaphor for narcissism. Yeah. And, and in Faust, of course, that's the battle between, uh, you know, divine and human knowledge, right? Yeah. Between uh, spare between uh, abstract knowledge and more contextual knowledge, I suppose, in your terms. Looking at water is more contextual. Looking at light is more abstract. So Plato, you know, said you must look at the source of the light, but uh, Faust set the problem of the Enlightenment as that of how do I see knowledge in the realm of the human. Maybe we can turn this to the topic of your podcast, which is um, coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So how do you think uh, this will affect, um, or what do you think uh, will change in architecture? I think that architecture as a, you know, capitalist production infrastructure will, uh, modify a little bit simply to accommodate the more uh, a different set of programmatic requirements in some ways, some small ways, mostly small ways about uh, parameters of design, perhaps spatial parameters, distancing parameters, access parameters, entry and access entry and exit parameters. But in, the, so that will probably be in the shorter, shorter run. And I think uh, it, it, it will also insist on the reconnection of the uh, knowledges and disciplines of planning and architecture and detailing. Uh, we have to produce better synergy across those disciplines and even beyond into sociology and public health. And this has become very obvious today. When okay. there is a pandemic, the solution is six feet. Now, six feet is a very specific architectural solution. A pandemic is a global health issue and a sort of a molecular biology, molecular. So the connection between an architectural dimension and a very complex viral ecology 
has never been clearer. Like, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Because um, do you think we should focus on the pandemic itself? Because for me, this would be more like a responsive architecture. So an architecture which tries to make everything possible that was possible before. So we try to uh, go back. We try, like, for instance, I don't know, there are, like, there's many... There have been many um, architectural designs, such as protection shields in the restaurant or protection sh shields on a, on a beach. But for me, this would be like, it's only like responsive. So it's not like an active architecture. Right. So we try to make something happen again, but this will never happen again. So the world already changed. And for me, I would like the architecture to be more like a future-driven architecture mm -hmm. that also like try to change the city, try to change the society and also make it a better future. So in a way you could think of the pandemic also as a chance. And I mean, what, what, what did the pandemic show us? It showed us how vulnerable our systems are. It right. showed us that maybe the next, the next crisis is already on the rise. And the next one will not be a pandemic. So I think we should um, more like create more resilient architecture, which can adapt to different crises. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just have to go, like you just have to look at your own country where you have these demonstrations against systematic racism. We have the theme of affordable housing where people are lacking uh, a secure place to stay. We're also having like the climate change coming up. So I think we more have to concentrate on crisis and in general, but not on this, this pandemic per se. No, I agree. The focus of architecture in the short run will be, you know, better partitions and, you know, better norms of distancing. And that will keep our professional uh, identity very limited and focused. But what will shift is that, you know, the intermediate scales of thinking new social systems, new social values, and thinking new protocols of health and hygiene, public health and hygiene, those will have to be shifted. And some of the shifts that have to happen over there will not come out of simply data-driven scientific analysis like they do. They will have to learn to think like architects. And we will have to try and better understand how the science works. So we will have to stop selling and they will have to stop insisting on disciplinary boundaries and rather recognize that we have to not make everything one, but to learn to weave together a series of knowledges from the scale of the face mask to the cultures of society, human cultures. In, in ways to make them resilient, they will have to be interconnected and be able to work much more harmoniously with each other. Harmoniously does not mean identically, but more interconnectedly. So that produces a different vision of, let's say, globalization uh, than the current vision. I don't think the solution, the opposite of uh, pandemic global, uh, of the pandemic as a global event or economic globalization, I don't think that the solution to that is simply to for all, us, all of us to sit in our own rooms or locally produced uh, architectural solutions and just like say nothing else. Rather, we have to learn to integrate better. But do you think that architecture can do this? Everything is architecture and our architecture is finished, whichever way you want to look at it. We have yeah. to rethink what architecture is. We have to stop saying architecture is this very specific thing. Uh, and indeed, like you said, more the more interesting thing about architecture is architectural thinking, architectural stories. So architectural stories uh, are, are social stories, economic stories, and then there are also medical stories and, and, and things. So if we want to tell stories, then we got to 
get into the fighting ring with other people who are telling stories. So those will be the social scientists and those will be the uh, medical scientists and, uh, and, the, and the business people. And so then we have to convince them they're all architects. And to do that, we have to think of architecture as a, as a medical practitioner does. I really would like to see the architecture becoming this, what you, what you were saying. Mm -hmm. But then maybe when it comes to reality, maybe we're just like um, stuck somewhere. Architects have lost so much power. Yes, yes, yes. We have lost so much power. We have ceded so much power. Uh, but architecture as the possibility of a different future with a sense of an optimistic possibility of a different future, that idea is still very alive and present in society. So uh, I think that that is still an, a great aspiration in civilization. Uh, we just are no longer the agents of that process. We are not, no longer at that table. Uh, we have ceded, seceded that to Elon Musk and to uh, the, the Silicon boys in Silicon Valley, or we have ceded that to the transgender people, or we have ceded that to the uh, uh, you know, uh, social scientists in some various ways. So how did we cede that, that, that sort of uh, synth uh, ability to synthesize possible futures in a condition of significant uh, uncertainty and unknowables with some known parameters, you know, that kind of speculative thinking like you do is what they claim to be doing also, but in different objects of interest, but they do connect to the, uh, the, the building scale as well. For me, I think one very important point is that we have to place the human back in the center of the design. And right now, when you look at the projects that have been doing in the cities, it's always about, it's all about money. So like in my city, in Munich, when you build the house, you don't think about the house itself. You just think about making the maximum out of, out of the space. And that's, I think, one thing, what you have to change, but it's a, it's a very political thing. So there it comes also the question for private property or public welfare. The pandemic has certainly shown us that, that, that the world can bring down the economic empires in, in very quickly, where the world here is its own ecology, not just the human. So I would agree with you, we have to put the human back in, but I would also say, not, but not just the human and certainly not the human as the center of things. We have to place ourselves as part of an interdependent and, and multi-species system, and maybe not a system, but just a sort of coexistence with other forms of being, other animals, plants, uh, and the planet itself at the center, yeah, rather, yeah. Than, rather than uh, a, some kind of a... A vision of prosperity for all. That's so true. I mean, it's as I said before. Like we have climate change; it, it will not, it's not solve the problem. Yeah. So uh, it's still there. <laughs> and uh, after the pandemic, uh, we can't like, or like we we have the chance like to change something. But because in times of pandemic, like there's so much changed. I don't know how it is in America, but right now in the politics in Germany. I mean, you have to know we have like a very, like it's like a welfare state. So you get financially supported many kind of um, industries. So they were thinking about um, also support, supporting the car industry, which is like in some point is like an old and not like a future, uh, future driven uh, economic, at least in Germany. So they wanted to support everything but because of the like the social power and demonstration of people they just lay, they, they couldn't do it you know one of the great uh, uh, misfortunes of the rise of the west with colonization and now with globalization is the huge amount of wealth that was generated 
via colonization and via industrialization. And one of the, I feel, really sad if effects of that was that wealth, and wealth as in material wealth, became the primary measure of wellness. So you, all things were calibrated, whatever from the right and from the left, in terms of money versus a some other framework of, uh, of life. Now in the old days, a really bad framework was, you know, religion, you know, your progress to heaven or, 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 or whatever you have. And that, of course, you know, very uh, problematic. Uh, but to replace that with money did not do us much service. So we have to return to a future framework, which is, uh, uh, which was the question perhaps Goethe was asking uh, in Faust. Like, what is our new framework? Maybe you live in the best country to change it. America? Yeah, I mean, it's a, <laughs> the turbo capitalist country. Yeah. I don't know. It doesn't look very likely right now with our political leadership and... <laughs> But also Trump, he's telling political stories. So he knows how to tell stories. And maybe we shouldn't like leave all this storytelling for the right wing and for the, uh, for the right, right, right wing parties. But we should also try to make our own stories and... Uh, To set something against this, maybe so. I was looking at uh, uh, at your at your bio, and it said you went to school in Dar es Salaam, uh, and that you lead the research on uh, on, on a lo low cost uh, housing lab. So I get some sense of your interest in low cost. But uh, what were you doing in Dar es Salaam, and uh, did that have any impact on your thinking? Um, Dar es Salaam, it was like an exchange exchange year, I think. The main thing why I was there was in my architecture school, we had to do urbanism. And I don't think, or I didn't think at the, at the present moment that the way how they taught urbanism in my school was, was very productive. So we, we looked up on, on plans from above And it stayed very much in, the, in this, um, it, so there was not much behind this. And that's why I tried to do something, or like I wanted to do urbanism in Dar es Salaam. And it's a very inspiring and very interesting city. I don't know if you have ever been to Dar es Salaam. No. It's the, the biggest city in um, East Africa. And I mean, it changed maybe more something for my... Uh, from private life and not in terms of architecture so it doesn't has like a like how a, did it change your private life maybe changed on how you look on things and uh in Dar es Salaam you see the people are poor but they most of them whom you meet they're like um they seem to be happy and that's something what I think we are missing in our western world so we just always um having like we're working 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 but um we're not like really living and that's what they in my opinion, they, they did in Dar es Salaam. Of course, I, I didn't see all, like you have poverty, which is too poor to live, but um, most of the people, they really enjoy their lives. In and contrast I, to Munich? Yeah, like I mean, when you are, are traveling with public transportation, mm -hmm. most of the people are like, they don't laugh. So they don't seem to be very happy. So they just like, I go to work like zombies. So yeah. that's maybe the thing what you said, like that putting money in the center of our society is maybe not the best solution. We should put laughter. Yes. <laughs> in a city for laughing, the, the, the city of uh, highest laughing index. I mean, it's like what they do in Bhutan. Like, like they... Happiness index, yes. So... Maybe that's a good start. I have never been there, so I don't know if it really works. Yes, so I think that would be a, that would be a good speculation. To uh, he, this is my challenge to you for your next project is to instead of making a house for a uh, house for light, make us a, a, a city for laughing.
Here, we transition over to our second guest, Ryan Skavnicki of Extra Office. His practice revolves around the production of meme making and jokes as a form of architectural critique. Enjoy. All right. Well, welcome to Architecture Talk, Ryan. Thank you for doing this. Uh, I'm looking forward to our conversation, particularly in these very extraordinary times of uh, architectural social isolation Mm -hmm. uh, at the time of coronavirus. Uh, Let me start off by perhaps quoting you. Mm -hmm. I have found, you you, you have said that uh, I believe wholeheartedly that we must amplify our dialogue to be more inclusive Mm -hmm. and rely less on the historical canon. And I mean, I presume you here mean the historical canon of architecture primarily. Mm -hmm that has been written for us. Uh, I'm also interested in how new conversation about architecture architecture is necessary and changing makeup can change architecture itself Mm. rather than just its representation. Mm. Uh, And what I think you are talking about over here is uh, uh, you know, to co- further quote you, my work is interested in aesthetics, contemporary culture, and media to seek new channels for critical practice. I have been asking the question, what does it mean for a meme to hold aesthetic implications and critical content? And I'm interested in asking, how can I make a meme into a building project? So, Ryan... <laughs> For those of us from a somewhat different, uh, let's say, generation, tell us what you mean by a meme and how it can be a building project. Awesome. Hey, thank you so much um, for having me. When I, when I say a meme, um, we're generally talking about the... It, if there's kind of two two sort of big definitions of memes, right? Uh, there's the more general... Uh, uh, mimetic term for sort of a unit of cultural transmission, which can be anything from, you know, saying God bless you after sneeze to the Macarena mm. to, um, uh, you know, any sort of these, these learned cultural behaviors. And, um, but the more specific definition of course is an internet meme, which would be, uh, those those pictures you see on the internet usually have uh, a caption or a t- text on them that uh, you know precariously judge or they showcase maybe a contemporary problem with um, uh, with humor, uh, but sometimes through that humor exposing a kind of deeper issue. Um, and mm-hmm. and those are the things uh, basically maybe. Uh, a few years ago, studying uh, a, a postgraduate degree at SciArc, where I just thought to myself, I don't know what is going to come of this, but I need to start doing it. And so I just started uh, generating uh, memes about architecture on my Instagram and just tried to really, at the beginning, only come up with a position at all that was legible through these things. Like I I wasn't sure how, how much I could say, you know, I was a little like, Mm -hmm. this is my first thing is to test how much I can say. Uh, Is it possible to, you know, create a a discussion about architecture? And, and I think uh, one thing I've found is that um, yes, I mean, you can say anything and you can, absolutely have deeper discussions. It's that the discussions happen through a sort of critical mass and buildup of this type of content coming from the same page and, and sort of working um, its way into the lives of, of the people who are following the account. So what I mean by that literally is just, you know, maybe every day I'll try to post a small meme, which has some kind of criticism, some, you know, I would say 70% of the time, it's just a silly joke. Uh, But Mm -hmm. even silly jokes at through critical mass, uh, it's sort of always hints at a greater kind of reflection about what architecture is doing, um, where the where the field is at the moment, 
and, and how we can uh, begin to have conversations it's just about like, hey, what 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 are we really doing here? So uh, to, to answer the question about whether a meme can be a building project, uh, that's something I'm still working on. You know, when I look at the history of architects, I've, I've certainly been able to to say, well, there's probably a history of architecture that you could build through talking about them as if they were memes, right? The corner, sure, sure. The corner yeah. You problem. talked about, yeah, the history is a kind of a meme, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the whole tradition of iteration and rethinking problems Absolutely. is kind of mimetic, is it not? Absolutely. And it's sort of, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, it's generational where you can trace sort of lineages and histories of discourses. And, and so really there's, and, and th- that's the the kind of, that's the funny thing about it though, is that memes are also just absolutely not new. Like, like there's nothing yeah. new about uh, <laughs> memes, um, but that the internet, I would say, maybe the, the, the splintering of dialogues across the internet has allowed for a positions or cracks. Sometimes I talk about like cracks of, of new positions sort of coming through or bubbling up because uh, you know, discourse could be considered to be flatter, or at least have more sub communities uh, talking about specific things within it. And so, um, I mean, meme, memes have a sort of a bottom up quality, right? I mean, the, uh, one of the things that I think uh, you talk about, which interests me very much, is that uh, memes can, in some ways, be considered to be uh, uh, very uh, connected to a broadly disseminated contemporary culture, which is both cynical and critical and constructive at the same time, and is a kind of modality that is certainly not being tapped into, as you say, by architects who use things like Instagram simply as a as a as as a picture picture diary. Yes, right? I mean so. I mean so. Talk to us a little bit about. Uh, you know, what is the meme culture can, today and what what is architecture missing here? I, I mean, one of the things that started the project for me was a kind of, I guess, a cynical attitude, if you want to call it that. It feels like architecture has always been a little bit cynical of itself, right? Um, but <laughs> sure. so, so it's kind of... Um, it's kind of embedded in the work, but that I was frustrated that it seemed like a lot of architects, even high profile ones, were simply starting an Instagram page to sort of put out pictures of the buildings they've done. And I think that obviously that's an important part of practice, right? But it's also a very it's also a very limited view of what architecture is about. And and believe me, I'm a I'm a big supporter of the architectural image and sort of its its agency in the contemporary world because of the popularity of just clean images of buildings on on Instagram and sort of how how we may sneak or or understand our role. But um but there's so much more what that's going on in architecture outside of the images that I that I think the public, especially or or at least people who are architecturally interested or you know would be more than willing or or more uh, want to understand a little bit more deeply about what uh, architecture is thinking about right. and trying to accomplish. Talk us through an example, if you will, uh, your own, uh, preferably, but even somebody else's of what you think is a uh, a, a good example of a uh, architectural meme. Which have been your sort of more liked memes, and uh, why do you think that is the case? People really like memes about Bjark Ingels. I think this is a good example of something that running a meme page also turns into a kind of hive mind you sort of become a little bit like you kind of want to give you, you recognize that the people really want you know something and and that makes my job difficult at times because you know there was certainly a level of me deciding okay i need to use memes what if i'm testing these things i want them to hold critical content, a cornerstone of critical content has been talking about a specific architecture practice, right? And I chose to to try f- to talk about Bjark's practice because mostly I felt like his reputation wouldn't be hurt or diminished by my sort of trolling. You know, like I didn't want to do this to somebody who actually, like I thought, oh, maybe they'll actually have negative 
emotion. But like, you don't have to apologize for that. I find that there's danger when criticism comes from the internet and it's sort of somebody who you don't know and could be even thought of as anonymous. I think there's a there's this there's this link between the institution and cyberbullying, which uh, memes t- start to get close to. And I, and I'm really uh, to test that the boundary of like okay. How how far can I go with without just being like this person's bad, or, right? You know, right. and and so I I've made a point to write about the positions that bubble up and try to further discuss the the issues with certain practices or certain things. Also, let's maybe another a better example. However, may, maybe green roofs. So mm. <laughs> uh, anytime I make a meme, sort of making fun of the green roof trope in architecture as a kind of neoliberal band-aid to just make a project sort of appear uh, more responsible. Uh, I think people, I think that's that's a really good maybe meme. A, a green roof can be thought of as a meme and as a signifier or a, a cultural signifier suggests that there's a sort of responsibility that this project is trying to attain when uh, we can analyze a lot of them and say, you kind of just slapped that on at the end. Um, sure, sure, absolutely. And so the, yeah. the Green Roof is a, is a great example of sort of contemporary, uh, not necessarily no. a meme format in specific, but um, a meme that can be thought of more as a cultural unit. I'm looking at your Instagram page, and I really like this one in which there is a there is this, uh, uh, you know, uh, distinguished, uh, more elderly looking white man uh, standing in what is clearly a polished uh, upper class apartment, looking out of what appears to be a doorway. And in front of him, there is a massive backhoe digging a huge hole into the ground. <laughs> and the man is uh, labeled the formalist discipline of architecture. And the backhoe is labeled 2020. I, mean, I think that's fantastic. I mean, it's just like such a commentary on uh, a, a, a huge schism between the discipline, even the, the both the academic and practicing discipline of architecture and what I guess you're identifying as a huge chasm being opened up by contemporary culture. I mean, I think uh, that's uh, that's that's a, 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 a key critique uh, that uh, you're you're pulling in, uh, is it not? I am so torn inside because at the same time I've been you know trained as a very like disciplinary uh, architect or even a formalist you know having gone through gone to SciArc and uh, having been you know worked I've worked at Coop Himmelblau and just sort of uh, really embedded in the discipline and in the academia it's sort of architectural speculation and and here's this uh, political situation we find ourselves in where you know the the most useful thing we can do is make our 3d printers make masks right at the same time it's a failure of many other entities that were also producing masks and not to say it's our fault right but that uh suddenly the you know formalism or the discipline or these uh sort of speculations i think are so important to remember what the what the real job of architectural speculation is right to imagine better worlds and to try to project and see our world in a new way because we're thinking about these you know maybe even a utopian project or a, or, or just a speculative speculation and that though that's the value right now that we maybe need to recover i'm sort of torn because it seems like the world needs more architecture but less buildings and right. and right. it's like how do we find ways of taking architectural ideas or architectural thinking or architectural speculation and still build it into the public imagination without necessarily building buildings or new buildings or you know gentrifying monsters that, that kind of thing right right that that's great Let, let's talk a little bit more about that you know we need more architecture but maybe not more buildings you know wh- what do you mean by architecture in this context what is your expanded aspirational definition for what an architectural practice might be well my own practice i am am using media in different ways to try to build up a critical discussion about architecture and 
I think in this way, um, the practice itself is looking to be sustained by by just the interest of the public rather than either institutions or newspapers. I think the 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 role of the architecture critic or the architecture academic, like uh, we don't have that many extra institutional architecture roles, right, in the discipline. You either teach or maybe you write at a, a publication. And, and, right. and I think um, for the first time... Or you make a podcast, yes. Right, exactly. Right. And I, I think the times are also sort of forcing our hand, but I, I think it's time that architects move, manip- try to move discourse outside of the institution. And one of the special things I saw going on at SciArc was that architecture seemed to be architecture seems to be seeping outside of itself into into other arenas especially through media and i think that's a a real important i I don't think that's an accident i think that's happening because there are just a lot of opportunities in in other through other mediums to explore what architecture might manifest as through these mediums and or architectural thinking right which is sort of just our ability to think and talk about new worlds and visualize or imagine them in different ways. And maybe that visualization or that, how do you understand another world? Maybe that's through video games, or maybe that's through podcasts, or maybe that's through uh, memes or drawings or it's, et cetera, film, right? Um, mm-hmm. And that that is the core of what we have to hold on to as a particular as a knowledge that is particularly held by architecture as a discipline, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it seems like, you know, architecture is, as practiced, is either a commercial capitalist uh, workhorse or is this high aesthetic, uh, you know, art form for, for, for the privileged uh, few. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas uh, what, I garner from the work that you're doing, and uh, you know, to, to to in in one sense, how, how how to make architecture into a daily cultural practice uh, through memes suggests to me that uh, perhaps architecture memes seem to me to be something like have have carnivalesque qualities, right? I mean, they have a sort of a a, a, a funny but serious critique of contemporary culture, particularly high culture embedded in them. And how could architecture take on take on that garb or take on that role to be more embedded in contemporary culture? Is that a sort of a possibility for an expanded sense of architecture? This is this is a great point you bring up because with my work, like trying to criticize individual architects or even individual buildings through memes has felt kind of like a dead end uh, or well maybe let's say just not that effective like i think uh people kind of like it if you just you know kind of dig on somebody but um at the same time i think the more important work is that you can spy by sort of being cynical or or or, or having a comedic take about architecture culture, you can change architecture culture. And if you change architecture culture, you can change architecture in a more effective way through criticism than, say, point out what architects do that's bad, right? Or point out mm-hmm. a specific architect and say, boo, you know, don't be like that architect. Uh, yeah. that- I mean, I think, uh, I think uh, what I'm hearing you say, or rather what I, uh, the way I look at it, is uh, it's not a matter so much about criticizing individual practices or particular buildings. It's more about uh, doing, uh, doing, uh, engaging in cultural practices that transform the generalized culture of architectural thinking. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, the idea is to change, uh, to 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 shift that culture. Of which individual practices and individual individual practices and individual buildings are only, you know, uh, 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 manifestations. I mean, how do we change the broad culture? Is the question and make it more uh, responsible to and responsive to uh, uh, contemporary culture. 
Yes, absolutely. And also in, in encouragement of extra architectural practices, right? I want students to feel, um, students who I teach, I want them to feel comfortable thinking about film or poly pocket, you know, cultural cues. As far as what constitutes the discipline, I think that line is pretty, pretty muddied and that I'm not that uh, concerned about it. I think right. it will yeah. sort of always always exist as a kind of there's always there's all sorts of bubbles right yeah 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 i mean it seems to me in in i mean it's it's a bit of a cliche in the discipline but it seems to me that you you know this muddied uh, outline of what is architecture uh seems to suggest perhaps today ever more than before that perhaps the discipline uh, is in some form of crisis. I mean, when you talk about allowing students to work with Instagram or, or, or TikTok or, or whatever, it's more about, you know, recognizing that they, they, they can do that. You know, we don't have to introduce them to these new media uh, realities. It's breaking down the possibility of thinking architecture through these new media possibilities. The crisis perhaps is a sort of significant schism between the realities of our students' uh, individual and cultural lives and the epistemic canons or hegemonies that we that we push in studio. Right? Let's let let me also ask you. Uh, you put in a big plug in your uh, writing uh, about uh, object-oriented ontologies. Mm -hmm. uh, and this seems to be uh, as high culture academic physics uh, uh, as it can get. Uh, what is your obverse sort of sudden fascination with uh, object-oriented ontology? Yeah, um, that's you are right on there. Um, it's pertinent conversation to to talk about architecture's fascination with philosophy. What makes it so wonderful to me is the the idea of flat ontology in general. Um, I think we're at a point where we're talking, we're less, we're less privileging the sort of human world relation and more interested mm -hmm. in um, other types of modes of being becoming valid modes of being as we talk about them. So in other words, the being that is an animal or a computer having just as much relevance or at least thinking about the relevance in terms of an architectural project at even privileging that uh, mode of being or at least deprivileging the sort of human world relation and thinking about the relation of other modes of, of being. Now, of course, we get into this conversation about, well, how do we know what it's like to be a machine? Or how do we know what it's like to be a cow? Well, we don't. No, we don't. <laughs> That's the right. Yeah. Uh, but we can yeah. at least start to have that conversation and open up that reality for architects as we as we move our practice into a world that's seemingly and less anthropocentric. Yes, yes, exactly. Thank you. Right. Um, you know, there, there's been architects of, I've been in a lot of discussion with like Gallo Canizares wrote a, a theory Twitter bot that takes apart uh, pieces of architecture theory. It recreates new sentences and tweets them out. And, you know, so, so we can have dialogues with these types of new, mo new modalities of thinking and uh, consider their production as uh, possibly, you know, as valid lines of inquiry when it comes to uh, bona fide modes of, of theory or what we consider to be. I mean, it seems to me certainly this uh, uh, sudden rising of the COVID-19 virus would wake us up to the fact that uh, uh, Certainly not the universe, but uh, even our planet is definitely not and interested in anthropocentrism, mm -hmm. right? Right, yes. People, you know, see Triple O as this kind of very reclusive kind of institutionalized object club. Um, and, you know, I think it would take a quite a bit of, I, I, I think that's changing, Um but it's still, it has this maybe reputation of being a kind of, you know, particularly because of its 
location or its um, relationship to Cyark as a kind of uh, image based or, or excuse to do cool shit, you know? And I just, I do think it's incredibly valuable beyond that. And I think that's a, a sort of a very naive reading of, of what triple O can mean if we really are investigating it in a, in a deeper way. And I, I think like things like maybe Timothy Morton as a great example of somebody who's influencing mm-hmm. architecture to, to think about ecology as always, like always already um, a mix of human world. Like there was never a separation and uh, ecologies, new ecologies of thinking about plastic ground as always plastic, right? Uh, like uh, in, in, you know, thinking about how architecture of the future of ecology is one that is always a bundle of stuff that is both human and natural. And that the mix between, there was never any separation between humans and nature. And I think that's a point that we as a discipline have to recognize. And I think that the sort of triple O brand maybe in architecture is, is thought of as this kind of, highfalutin thing when it's like oh man we we really need that to 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 be understood as just a line of in, a new lines of inquiry so i think triple o is sort of already happening but people aren't calling it that or you know or or people are are not directly relating back to the philosophy but they're doing the work that the philosophy is maybe thinking about in in different different ways or you know you don't have to call it triple o to just say hey I want to make a project about sustainability that decenters the human. Like that, you don't have to call it a triple O project to, to do that. So, uh, Ryan, thanks for taking the time and for being on Architecture Talk. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is your producer, Amelia Jarvanen. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. And if you did, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Spotify. We would also love to hear from you if you have any suggestions on new topics or guests. You can always reach out to us on our website, Facebook, or Instagram. Thanks again, and until next time, this is Architecture Talk.